kind of a harsh title. I didn't really mean for it to be that harsh. So um, I'm here from the Ceph project, but I'm not really here to talk about Ceph today. I'm here to talk about SourceForge. Uh, before I joined uh, Ink Tank to sort of help with the Ceph project, I spent 10 years at SourceForge from the beginning of 2000 to the very end of 2009, and uh, I saw a lot, and I was hoping that I could sort of share the story of what I saw at SourceForge and what happened, because uh, I was there for sort of the rise, and I was there for kind of what happened after the rise, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, maybe it can, it can provide some context. So uh, talk about the dawn of the Forge, why it was built, uh, how it made money, what happened, what changed in the landscape, uh, why GitHub was successful in ways the SourceForge was not, and what we need now, what we're using currently at Ceph, and what types of things can be hosted, and what types of things we think can't be hosted. So first, the dawn of the Forge. Um, why SourceForge was built. Uh, if you remember, in 1999 when SourceForge was built, Google didn't exist and hosting cost money. Uh, those are the two things to keep in mind. Um, obtaining hosting for open source projects was really hard. It was hard to get server space. Uh, a lot of it was hosted by universities, government, that sort of thing. There were not a whole lot of uh, commercial open source on the internet at the time in, in 1999. Um, and code was being written and lost every day. So people were writing open source code, they had nowhere to put it, nowhere to host it, and it was going away. Uh, so the, the original code name for SourceForge was Alexandria. That was the name of the code base, was Alexandria, after the Library of Alexandria, which was uh, only an apt name if you don't know what happened to the Library of Alexandria. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the issue that, that VA Linux at the time was trying to solve was that there was a lot of fragmentation in where this code was hosted. It was difficult to find it, and frankly, they needed apps for Linux to drive demand for Linux servers. They needed there to be a broad selection of applications on top of Linux to drive demand for servers, which now we think is kind of a ridiculous idea because ah, it was, we knew it was going to happen, but that's, that's hindsight. At the time, we weren't sure. Uh, the culture at VA Linux in the early, uh, early times, and Carson can keep me honest here because he was there as well, was very visionary and innovative. We felt like we were the ones that could solve this problem. We cared about the future of open source and we thought that no one else was going to do it. And there was a, a fair amount of overconfidence uh, in, in sort of what we were, what we were doing there. Um, so this is, this is the climate when SourceForge was built. It began, uh, it was built over less than three months. Um, a core team of, I think, five people built it in less than three months, uh, fueled by pizza, um, relying on heroics, uh, and it was extremely ambitious in scope. So a lot of it was partially un unimplemented. There was a task manager in SourceForge that was still unimplemented five years after the site launched, although it was there. You could go and find it. It just didn't work uh, because the original site had everything. It had everything a project could want. Bug tracking, source code management, websites, form, mailing lists, download hosting, code management, task management, everything. It was huge, and it grew very quickly. Um, the first downtime of SourceForge was when they had to shut the servers down and move them from the office to the data center because they were getting too big. Uh, and that happened shortly after the site's launch. So lots of users, lots of projects, tons of bravado at the time. And if you worked at VA Linux at the time, you heard this in the hallway 30 times a day. Oh yeah, and then when you're done, you put it on SourceForge. Like, I heard that in the hallway all the time at VA Linux. That was the way that it was, it was very, you know, uh, very, very forward-looking and visionary. And this is what SourceForge.net looked like in the very early days with its super cool uh, logo and um, you know it's it's you I know huh you can find this on the Wayback Machine um, you know uh, uh, I didn't put this in the screenshot but there also was the top users and it was all the founders of SourceForge because they seeded it with them being the most important and then they would give kudos to other people which they never did um, so how did it make money uh, originally it was there to drive demand for Linux servers but the Linux server business went away shortly after I started in 2000 um, as it turns out uh, a small company like VA Linux can't compete with every server vendor on the planet shipping Linux boxes, right? They just can't compete. So they started running ads on the site to keep things operating. Um, and this, was, this represented a, a big sort of shift in SourceForge.net. Um, VA Linux shifted gears at this point, becoming VA software, and they decided to focus on SourceForge, but not SourceForge.net. They decided to focus on SourceForge Enterprise Edition as a commercial product. They closed the source code for SourceForge.net and decided essentially to sell it to enterprises. Uh, I was part of the team that originally delivered it into enterprises before I jumped across the fence to go over to SourceForge.net. Um, but it continued to operate as a media site. And at this point, we're looking at about 20 million unique visitors a month. We're looking at 150,000 projects, two engineers, one DBA, and two people in operations running the whole thing. Uh, it was incredibly understaffed at the time, and you could tell. Uh, services would go down. Um, everybody who worked on the team had the, uh, the sort of 
um, uh, we all broke the site. Like I took the site down for four hours one time. Everybody took a site down. It was a rite of passage. Uh, very difficult to, to keep things operating with such a small staff. Um, so they, they, they shifted gears again at some point, becoming SourceForge Inc. So they left the software business. Selling SourceForge didn't work out quite as well. They left that business, and then they decided, well, we're going to now double down on SourceForge.net. Uh, so they, they, uh, we then had 12 engineers, seven people in ops. We had lots of people there. Uh, we didn't change the basic strategy. It was still a media site, uh, except now there's extra emphasis on the ad revenue because you're talking about 30 million unique visitors a month. This is money, and money that comes in is an encumbrance to a company that's listed on NASDAQ, and that's, that's what we learned over time. There's money coming in in the form of ad revenue. became something you couldn't turn off, right? It became something that, that you needed in order to keep moving forward. So this reminds me of a quote, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. Any, I don't, if anybody knows who said this, I'd love this, but if you aren't the customer and you aren't the vendor, you're the product. And this is the truth. Uh, at SourceForge, our customers were advertisers. We were the vendor. Our product was the community, right? That's how it was there. That's just, that's just the reality. We didn't think about it that way, but that was the reality of the situation. As a media site, our product is our community. So as if that wasn't enough of a storm cloud, uh, trouble started looming. Here's what happened. Hosting got cheap, real cheap. You know, you can get a server for 10 bucks a month from Linode. Why not host it all yourself? Uh, in addition to that, Google Code, Berlioz, Savannah, Object Web, and dozens of others started providing uh, ad-free similar services. So all of a sudden, being free was not enough of a value prop, right? Having everything in one place and having everything be free wasn't enough of a value prop. Also, search became real. Like, it, it, it no longer was important for everything to be in one place. Google is the library of Alexandria, not SourceForge. There isn't just one. There, I mean, there isn't just one for every type of, there's one, you know? You don't really need it. So discoverability was solved better elsewhere. Ooh, wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> discoverability was solved better elsewhere, right? I mean, we couldn't build a better Google for finding open source code. We just couldn't. Um, Software maps were replaced by that, and uh, top projects lists that you, you know, companies used to get funded because they were on the top projects list of SourceForge, that was replaced by SEO. That's how people got their project discovered instead. So search became practical. And also, contribution evolved over time, right? The tools changed. CVS and Subversion give way to Git. You start to introduce Jenkins, continuous integration type of things, more advanced ways of building stuff. Uh, languages changed. Perl and PHP give way to Ruby and Python, but that's almost more indicative of an underlying culture change, right? People are changing. They're writing in different languages. They're caring about different things. Uh, visual design and elegance matters for the first time, right? You notice that screenshot of SourceForge.net I showed. That wouldn't fly today. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't fly today with modern developers. Uh, and there was a bit of a shift towards DevOps, right? Away from sort of these, these sort of walls of responsibility, more towards DevOps. So here's what we were doing when that happened. We were focusing on running our business more efficiently. I was the dr uh, uh, director of engineering at the time there. We were trying to keep things up. We were trying to take this architecture that was never built to scale the way that it was scaling and make it stay up. Uh, it kept, it was, you know, make it not crash every 10 minutes. Make it so we don't need to have you know, cron jobs rebooting our web servers every 10 minutes like we did. Uh, and we were focusing on maintaining this balance by showing advertisers we had the audience they needed to reach, showing developers we could offer the services they needed, and showing users that, they had, that we had all the open source code they needed in one place. So we're trying to balance all of these three constituencies. This is what we were doing. Here's what GitHub was doing. <laughs> GitHub was focusing on one problem. They weren't focusing on discovery. They weren't focusing on infrastructure. They were focusing on contribution. And what they did was they built a solution that lowered the barrier to entry for contribution to open source projects. If you noticed, the logo that you had on your slide said GitHub social coding. SourceForge was project hosting. GitHub was social coding. See the difference? One is solving a problem. One is providing a service. Do you know? So it's, it, it, they took it back a level. Um, so the, what, what they built was something that was simple and clean, resonated with modern developers. They went deep instead of broad. At this time, SourceForge was figuring out how to offer CVS and Subversion and Mercurial and <laughs> Bazaar and everything at the same time so that we could reach as much of the audience as we could because building a broad audience was required for the ad business, right? However, uh, we weren't really thinking about what it took to solve problems and, and make developers contribute. We weren't thinking about that because we were too stuck in our business is the truth. 
Uh, oh, by the way, this is all my opinion, <laughs> just, <laughs> just in case that wasn't completely clear. I don't work for SourceForge anymore. A lot of very nice people work for SourceForge, and this is just my opinion. Um, so GitHub's model is also different. They chose a model that was aligned with the open source community, right? The ad business is not always aligned with the open source community because, A, you make money when somebody's experience gets disrupted. Right? <laughs> and you're trying to get them to contribute, right? So that's a problem. The second thing is Microsoft Ads in 2007, not particularly well received, right? Uh, they paid very, very well. They paid very, very well. And I felt a little good at night going to bed thinking that Microsoft's money was going to help the open source community in some small way, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't the right model. Whereas GitHub's model built and sold a service for developers. They, 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 they chose a model that rewarded them when they provided a service that was useful, it was a subscription model. We were selling rectangles. They were selling a service for developers, right? Um, the other thing that's different about the model is that advertising, as a company that was selling advertising on an open source community, we cared about consumption more than creation because consumption was 95% of our traffic and traffic was the metric that, would, that, that, that was relative to, to revenue for us. So the model that we had forced us to focus on consumers more than creators, which is, a big challenge. And we, we, we fought against this and tried not to do that, but it was just the reality of the situation. So here's what we need now. This is what Ceph runs on. Um, similar slide to what you had. Uh, we were originally hosted on SourceForge, but now we are not. Uh, today we use GitHub for SCM and what I like to call contribution management, which is no one ever calls it that. But really it's just if somebody wants to contribute to the code, that handles the process for us. We use Redmine for issue tracking. We use MindTouch for a wiki. Um, we're using MailMind for our mailing lists. We use OFC, OFTC's IRC network and WordPress for our website. This is what we use. So what can be hosted? I, when, we start, when I started looking at this question of what can be hosted, really what I was thinking was, which parts of a project infrastructure can be provided by a third party in a scalable way? Scalable meaning multi-tenant here, right? So I have all these services that I'm running. This one, I don't need to run because somebody else running it is exactly the same. It's a one-size-fits-all solution that I don't need to spend time maintaining because somebody else can do it just as well. That's the type of thing that I'm thinking can be hosted. And here are a few examples of things I can. Tools for getting things done that are well understood by the community, right? GitHub is one of these things. We host on GitHub because everybody understands how to contribute to our project on GitHub. Everybody gets it. There's benefit to doing th things the same way that other people do. Nobody has to learn how to contribute to Ceph. Everybody already knows because it's standard. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what GitHub gives us. And also, I mean, the task managers, um, mailing lists, IRC, using standard things that are the way that everybody does it already are the types of things that can be hosted. That's, that's kind of my, my opinion. Uh, so all the standards-based stuff, things that are tools for actually getting things done that people already understand and they're already used to working with. So what can't be hosted? Uh, <laughs> A continuous experience for users that preserves the project's brand, conveys quality, and showcases the community. This is the problem I have with hosting something entirely, is that you're no longer in control of the experience of those who are coming to discover, evaluate, and consume your technology. When they go to Ceph.com, they need to see something cool. They need to see something that is clear, that explains everything, that links them to the appropriate tools properly, and that is custom built for that community, those contributors, and that audience. And that's something that you can't, it's not one size fits all. So the discovery, the, uh, uh, the discovery and the um, consumption experience, I think is not a one size fits all experience. And also what we can't host is our lab. Uh, I mean, we can, we, can, we can have it hosted somewhere, but we have to maintain it and manage it because it's, it's a lab specifically for testing Ceph, which is you know, a, a very, very specific thing. So the other thing that can't be hosted, and these are just some of my thoughts. I wouldn't be tempted to host everything in a single platform. And I know that there are companies who are, whose business model is, we provide you everything you need to run an open source project. Well, GitHub solved a single problem well, while SourceForge solved every problem not so well. And that was the difference, right? So if I'm running an open source project today, I pick services that solve the problems that I need to solve in a very precise way. Uh, but I would be very, very, very leery about a solution that tells me that it's going to give me everything that I need <laughs> because I don't think that it will. Also, last parting thought, understand how your providers make money, <laughs> right? If you're paying them for the service, that's one thing. If you're not, they're still making money from you and you should, you should know how they're doing it because one day it might encumber you. Uh, 
Anyway, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> no? <laughs>